Uh, right, we, um, we have just under an hour. The system works fantastically well. There are a lot of other questions I could have asked, so don't sit on your hands at the beginning. Get the questions coming through, particularly now for this critical issue of geopolitics of East Asia. Here we are about 10 days on from what we saw in Beijing on the 3rd of September. All of you will have your own view of what took place and what kind of signals are being sent. And some of us have just got back from Dalian, from the World Economic Forum meeting there, picking up indications of where things are going from the Chinese and international perspective. And Jesper gave us an interesting segue, which I'm glad no one really wanted to pick up, and I certainly wasn't going to pick him up, when he said, quote, there's a danger of Japan becoming a colony of China. So we're not going to resolve that by the end of this session. But there are, there are uh, very important signals which are emerging, uh, which we want to try and clarify in the next hour. And we have extraordinary insight here. Again, we're on the record. Please send messages. It's very helpful to push the discussion in a direction which is on your mind. Let's go to Kuni Miyaki, first of all, if we may, for your assessment of where the geopolitics of East Asia are at the moment. Uh, you have significant experience in this region and in uh, the foreign ministry and in China and elsewhere. The floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, I, I, I like to say, Mr. Hori, that you picked the wrong person. OK? <laughs> I'm not the right person to be here. And uh, more than that, uh, I do not trust economists who use the word geopolitical risks. OK? Geopolitical risks are the concept that the economists don't understand. When they don't understand things, they use the word. And I, I, I think uh, many of those things can be clearly explained. So how this is my take. Um, when I see the international situation anywhere on, on this earth, I always use three concentric circle sort of approach, analysis. One is the global concentric circle, regional and uh, bilateral or internal. So when it comes to uh, global concentric circles, what, what I see in this world is the post-Cold post War era is, is, is starting. Post-Cold War is over. And in a nutshell, that's the era where uh, a neo nationalism is back. Okay? What's happening in Europe? on the ground. I think it's, it is a combination of uh, nationalism, old nationalism, and the imperialistic sort of uh, DNA of maybe Russians uh, to, to uh, change the status quo. And unfortunately, the rise of nationalism is not uh, European at all. It's global. And I can think about, I can talk about the Middle East for hours if you want me to, but I won't do that. This time, the only thing I can say, because I like to make it short, the problem is that the United States, unfortunately, is not fully uh, uh, dealing with this kind of new situation for the past seven years, and maybe in the next year as well. So let's move on to the second concentric circle. This is a regional uh, concept. Of course, the, there are many, many uh, power shifts going on on this earth. But uh, at this moment, in this part of the world, uh, it is the rise of China, of course. Peacefully or unpeaceful, I do not know. The Chinese don't know either. So the problem is, in a nutshell, nobody knows what's going to happen to that country. And uh, not the, the essence is, who's going to control the PLA? Who's going to control the armed forces of the Communist Party? And this is the, uh, how I see uh, uh, the PLA in this, uh, 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 from here. So unfortunately, as I said, what's happening on the ground in Europe is probably quite similar to what's happening on the waters in Asia. Okay, I do not go into details, but this is also uh, another challenge 
of uh, the combination of old ugly nationalism and the imperialistic instinct to change the status quo, which is basically unjust for those people. Finally, um, Japan-China relations. Uh, I may not be the right person, although I uh, started studying Chinese back in 1973, and I'm one of the uh, so-called uh, Japan-China uh, friendship uh, fellows. Okay? I believed in Japan-China friendship, and I still do. But having said that, unfortunately, for the past 43 years, since 1972, there are two, the first half is, is, is a good time, until 1989. But since 1990, things have been uh, changing. So what the Japan-China relationship is not the, uh, itself uh, uh, my most uh, uh, serious sort of uh, uh, concern. Because the, this bilateral relationship is, is a, a one of the variables of when it, when it comes to the global or regional uh, or geopolitical uh, uh, transformation. So uh, in my view, um, from the geopolitical point of view, Japan is a status quo power. We don't want to change the status quo. You know, we tried before, 70 years ago or 80 years ago. We failed. We will never repeat that mistake again. But unfortunately, in my view, China might be repeating the same old mistake that we have made. In, 19, in the 20s and 30s. What are they? The mistakes are the following. The combination of ugly nationalism with the imperialistic instinct, uh, especially quite popular among not only the people, but among the armed forces officers. Trying to change the status quo around you, and they want to wanted to do that by force, challenging the US hegemony in the Western Pacific. And in, a, in our case, we failed for natural reasons. And I'm trying to convince my Chinese friends, OK, don't repeat the same mistake again. OK? You would be much better off to be uh, more international, to be more democratic, and to be more uh, 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 less assertive, I would say. Uh, this is uh, how I see uh, uh, this world and this part of the world. And what Japan should do is survival. We have to survive this huge, huge um, uh, power shift, power change. Um, what's going to happen to China? I do not know. You will not know either, because the leadership doesn't know in China either. So we will welcome the uh, hurt wholeheartedly if China wants to become a responsible member of the inter regional international community in this part of the world. We will, we will encourage them to do that. But if not, we have to prepare ourselves for the failure. And the failure could be, could be fatal. So that's why uh, we are investing a little bit more on our deter deterrence power in order for anybody uh, to, 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 to know in advance that it will cost you a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, sobering assessments there, particularly of China. Uh, there's a question here from Lawrence Tan. How does Japan view China's resurgence? How should Japan react on China's attempt to change the status quo? I leave that parked for the moment, but that's the kind of thought that's coming uh, from the delegates here. Uh, let's go to Shitao next. Um, particularly, if you can respond uh, to what we just heard there, uh, ugly nationalism imperial instincts, 
a leadership which doesn't know. Oh, what, uh, okay. Um, first, you know, I, I was very really surprised when I found like I'm actually the only Chinese, you know, on the uh, a list of the speakers. And and besides, you know, my views can be way, way unrepresentative of the mainstream views of uh, my colleagues, IR scholars, and others. But let me say a few words about this uh, worry about China. Uh, let me start with this uh, 3rd of September, um, uh, Nick just mentioned. I think on many issues, there's a big perception gap between foreigners who watch China and Chinese analysts you know, who watch China. It seems to me that the primary purpose of the military parade is not about Japan at all. It's not about the United States. It's about Chinese domestic politics. It's about President Xi Jinping asserting himself as the top leader, as the first among the equals. You know, he is not sending a message to the United States and Japan. Now we have all these weapons, and so you guys behave yourself. And you just look at a piece, two pieces from the People's Daily. You know, one is about uh, the title just says military parade is all about a review of the army's uh, military's anti-corruption campaign. This is a front page story from the People's Daily. And then there's another piece uh, saying like the similar thing. Uh, it's about like, you know, showing uh, the military's loyalty to China's uh, top civilian leader. There's, there's no discussion about deterring somebody, Japan or the United States. Um, second, uh, speaking of Japan, China, I, you know, Glenn asked me, you know, how many times I've been to Japan. This is my fourth time. And each time I came here with a little happy surprise, you know, by the friendliness of the taxi drivers, you know, by the people I asked, you know, asked for directions. Like this morning, I got lost on the streets, you know. Um, and my students are doing homestay in a city south of Japan, and some of my students are doing graduate study here. So I think at the popular people-to-people -people level, we, we should never really overestimate that kind of hostility between the two peoples. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you, you guys all know this story about the, um, the past year's the Spring Festival. Hundreds and thousands of Chinese uh, flooded over to Japan, right, just to buy the toilet lids. You know. that's, that, that's one example. <laughs> Now, on the one hand, you say, oh, there's this, this danger of, uh, you know, uh, super jingoistic nationalism sentiments in China, and people are really hating China, Japan. But then you look at the tourists. These are rational people. They go to Japan. You know, well, maybe they have some bad feelings about the Japanese past. But you ask them, you know, what do you like about Japan? I can tell you a lot of people do like Japan. Clean, very orderly, you know, uh, food is safe, and other things. The air is much better in Beijing. I mean, th there are many things. It's just like if you talk about this soft power, when you say McDonald's, you know, the Starbucks, you know, so Chinese go to these places, and so they are internalizing American values. I'm pretty sure when people come over to Japan and they are deeply impressed by this, everything that's so orderly, you know, you don't worry about theft, you know, pickpocket and others, people do carry that kind of a good impression back to their own home country. So when I go back to my hometown, Sichuan, I, I think that my hometown, Sichuan, is probably one of the hotbeds of nationalist sentiments. When I go back to my students in high school, teachers and others say, don't talk about Japan until you go to Japan. Take a look there. And why Japan is so much more powerful than China, at least you know, for probably the next decade. Because you know? so there's no way that serious people are thinking about having a war with Japan. But having said that, I, I, I said somewhere, I said, you know, in international relations, you cannot choose your neighbor. You cannot choose how you are treated by your neighbor, but at least you can choose how to treat your neighbor. So maybe China cannot choose your, you know, Japan as a neighbor. Japan cannot choose China, but at least you can choose how you treat Japan or how you treat China. Maybe the Chinese government just uh, you know, send out all these bad messages to the Japanese government or the people, and then the Japanese government do some similar thing. But at the popular level, I think you know, th there's a danger of overestimating that sentiment. And final point before I hand back to Nick, you know, about Prime Minister Abe's speech, I have to say this speech was, was, was very disappointing to many Chinese, and I would say to many people uh, across the globe. I remember that he used uh, you know, one phrase, which is, I would say terrible. He said, you know, women whose honor and dignity were injured during the Second World War. That's euphemism. Everybody knows you know, who he was talking about. And if, if you have the courage of addressing this issue, why don't you just do this like, like, like an ordinary politician in Europe and the United States and stand up face the issue? We did something terrible. And also he said, you know, 
the war, you know, uh, today about 80% of Japanese population were born after 1985. And these people are innocent. They should not be held responsible for what happened in 1940s and 1930s. Correct. But when you say this, you are basically saying, well, maybe past is past. And let's put them into dust bin, you know. We, we never face it again. I think, you know, that's why there is kind of like a decreasing of this rising momentum between the two countries. My colleague just said, you know, there seems to be our signs of an improving China-Japan relationship. The last time you had this 3,000 member of China-Japan friendship delegation to Beijing, which was received by President Xi Jinping himself, that was a high mark of Japan-China relationship. And then you had this terrible speech. I have to say this is a terrible speech. I stop here. No, don't stop there, because I w you haven't really answered the point about ugly nationalism and imperial instincts, because quite apart from having good relations, it's, a make, it's about making strategic assessments of the direction right, of travel right. of China, or already quite understandably, one's getting questions here about the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and the potential for misunderstandings. Well, if you say there is indeed rising ugly imperialism or nationalism, give me some credible poll evidence. I know there's a problem in China, like it's very hard for you to do this scientific, like Gallup or you know, um, the other type of- I think we're talking about a tone here in language and what we saw on the September- the Right, 3rd. right, but the language is from the government. It does not then necessarily represent the language of the people. We all know that, right? That's my first counter argument about this rising nationalist sentiment. And then the Chinese can also point to this uh, handful of so-called you know, right-wing militarists in Japan. You can do the same thing, pointing fingers at each other. Right? And second, about this uh, imperialist uh, plan of uh, uh, Japan becoming a colony of, of China, th that will have to have this assumption that China does have a long-term strategy, grand strategy to colonize Japan and others. I'm sure some of you heard about the book, A Hundred Year Marathon by Michael Pillsbury. Now that's a total conspiracy theory. China has a theory of a plan to overtake Japan and the United States and beat them up and become the number one, the real middle kingdom in the world. I think that's total nonsense for anybody who understands the Chinese leadership. All right, well, um, I think there are a lot of questions, but if I may put just one, if you're building a 7,000-foot runway mm -hmm. on a few rocks in the middle of the sea, right. that does suggest something a little more than just supporting fishing vessels. Right, right, exactly. I, I was just going to say this, you know. I think you look at the South China Sea Islands, I think if you were a military planner, you look at the world map, South China Sea is the only place where China can do something like what the United States did in the Guam Islands. It's forward deployment for China. You already have Japan, you already have uh, Korea, you already have the Guam Islands. And so the eastern part of China's uh, land territory is actually closed off. And so the only place where you can really, on the Pacific side, is go to south, spread islands, build up those artificial islands. So you can threaten US allies, just like the Guam Islands threaten China. All right. Right, well, um, I should be asking you what you're writing in the next edition of Living with the Dragon, how the American public views the rise of China. But Glenn Fukushima from uh, Washington is going to help you with the, the rewrite of that, given that, uh, given, that, uh, given that the Chinese president is about to go to Washington. Uh, let's hope they introduce him as from the correct country, unlike his predecessor, who was introduced as the president from Taiwan. But uh, no doubt they'll get the right recording on the PA system in the yes. White House. Um, he's also going to meet uh, some business leaders, although Mark Zuckerberg, having learned Chinese, is not sure if he wants to be there. Glenn, what's your assessment of, uh, of this issue of geopolitics? politics in East Asia, particularly from the U.S. perspective? Fine. Well, I'll, I'll make uh, just three quick points. Uh, I was, just before the three points, I'll just mention that from 1985 to 90, I worked in Washington, D.C. at USTR, also the U.S. Trade Representative, in uh, trade negotiations between the United States and Japan and the United States and China. And then for 22 years, I was working in Japan in business. And then three years ago, I returned to Washington. And since three years ago, I've been at the Center for American Progress, which is a think tank. Uh, created 13 years ago, and uh, focusing mainly on uh, U.S. policy in my work, uh, U.S. policies towards Asia. Uh, so three things about uh, U.S. Uh, perceptions of Asia um, from Washington, D.C. The first is that despite the rhetoric that we've heard, I think that many people in, in Washington, D.C., most people in Washington, D.C., uh, look at Asia as a relatively stable part of the world. 
And compared to the Middle East, uh, Syria, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Ukraine and Russia, Israel and its neighbors, uh, obviously there are problems with North Korea and with China, but in terms of open conflict, deaths, refugees, Asia doesn't exhibit those, at least right now. And I think that um, means that the level of attention being given in Washington towards Asia is constant, but not at a high pitch as it is to many other parts of the world. So that's number one. Number two is within this context, uh, Japan is seen uh, both in Washington and in the United States generally as the most trusted country in Asia. There was recently a Pew Research poll that was uh, done, a pretty extensive poll, uh, and it showed that 68% of the American public uh, feel they can trust Japan, a great amount or a fair amount, uh, versus 30% who felt that they could trust China a great deal or a fair amount. In fact, 47% of Americans said that they trusted Japan so much that they felt Japan should play a more active military role in regional affairs in Asia, 47%. Now, the Japanese response to that was 23%. Only 23% of Japanese thought that Japan should play a more active military role in regional affairs in Asia. So, in addition to the um, trust level, uh, I would say that, and also the, the, uh, the poll asked the same question and divided the uh, results into independents, Republicans, and Democrats, and found independent 71%, Democrats 66%, Republicans 69%, pretty even level of high trust by Americans towards Japan. And then favorable ratings, again, the ratings of, the, of Japan by Americans, 74% favorable, 18% unfavorable. With regard to China, 38% favorable, 54% unfavorable. I think uh, Prime Minister Abe's recent trip to uh, the United States, four cities including Washington, D.C., uh, in April and May proved to be quite uh, positive, constructive, and I think uh, the results were indicative of the close relationship between the U.S. and Japan. The third point I'd make is that with regard to China, uh, there is uh, considerable concern, uh, both in Washington and also in the public generally. With regard to the uh, public, again, the Pew Research poll uh, showed that uh, there are eight, at least eight areas of concerns that uh, Americans have about China. Uh, one, large amount of American debt held by China, the loss of US jobs to China. Uh, I suppose part of the Donald Trump uh, argument. Uh, third is cyber attacks from China. Fourth, China's policies on human rights. Fifth, US trade deficit with China. Uh, sixth, China's impact on the global environment. Seventh, China's growing military power. Uh, and eight tensions between China and Taiwan. So I think that it's quite clear that with regard to China, uh, the U.S. government as well as the U.S. public sees uh, a long list of, of issues. Uh, as uh, Nick mentioned, uh, President Xi Jinping is uh, due to arrive in Washington on the 24th of September. And just within the last couple of days, there have been reports of additional activity on uh, two reefs in the South China Seas with regard to building up uh, airfield capabilities. Uh, and so this is a, a continuing area of concern. Um, so I would just conclude by saying that uh, although there are tensions in East Asia, and uh, in the long, medium and long term, these are issues that require considerable attention, I think that from Washington's perspective, um, overall Asia is relatively stable. and. Uh, doesn't exhibit the immediate um, uh, crises that are seen in other parts of the world. Uh, I think that it'll be important going forward for the United States to be working closely with allies, in particular with Japan and with South Korea, Australia, Philippines, Singapore, and others, uh, and to engage with China and to try to minimize the, uh, the negatives and uh, encourage the positives. Thanks there. Uh, very much. David Asher, I think you've just arrived. I'm sorry to, to ping you, but, but given, wh given where you've just, uh, you come from, from DC, can you help us, given your perspectives back in Washington uh, on this? Can we get a microphone, please? David just arrived. 
Yeah, I know he Sorry, just arrived. I, I, had, I had to go back to my hotel room to talk to uh, people over in Korea about it, what's going on in China. Um, so, uh, but we're talking about <laughs> geopolitics of East Asia. Yeah, yeah, so no, no, no. Give, there's, give, there's give us, lot, give as us just ben three. Out, there's a lot of stuff happening. David, right give now. us just three minutes, can you, to help us fix a little more on, on the Washington view? Well, the Washington view is that. Uh, the pivot to East Asia is, is, is sort of the, the main policy theme, but you know the, the, the reality is, 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 is that for the administration, I think it's become a little bit of a beat, beat and retreat strategy from the Middle East, which they really can't get out of, and uh, it, it's, 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 it's really confounding them. I mean, this uh, she uh, Obama summit is going to be very complicated. I think that they had all they had a lot of hopes that they could have a smooth relationship, but then the Chinese, you know, massively attacked us uh, on that cyber level. Um, they're dumping ma huge amounts of uh, steel, aluminum, and excess inventory of all sorts of stuff in the United States market, so the Congress is getting very antsy. And, uh, and then we've got this uh, cr absolutely sort of crazy and audacious uh, dispatch of uh, Chinese warships into the uh, Aleutian Islands, part of our territorial waters, which is, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, it's caused an issue uh, of concern that, that that's only magnified by what the Chinese are doing, as Glenn just pointed out, in the South China Sea. And, and the key point about those, uh, the South China Sea facilities is that you know, at least one of them has a 10,000-foot airstrip on it. And uh, the question is why? Well, they've just, they've just displayed their new bomber. It's a strategic-level bomber that they, they showed in Beijing at the 114-step march, which Cooney can talk about, I think, um, that, uh, that it's capable of... Uh, delivering, you know, potentially nuclear weapons, very large conventional payloads as well, both uh, from those airstrips in the South China Sea, or that airstrip, both to Guam and to Taiwan and to Japan. And so, you know, not only could they block the long literal line of communication, the sea line, lane of communication, which is very critical to international trade to the Straits of Malacca, they have the ability to essentially do a backdoor attack looking two years ahead uh, against Taiwan, or at least intimidate them. And I think that, you know, what, the 114-step march, which I think, I don't know if it's been mentioned already, was very important. Just underscore that, can you? Yeah, I mean, the point is the Chinese were doing this, that when they were marching in this parade, they were, like, doing 114 steps and stopping and doing another 114 steps. What happened 114 years ago? Sino-Japanese War. You know, this is an obvious level of, of uh, in, uh, you know, and they're not just intimidating, you know, Japan, they're intimidating the United States because at the same time they're sending warships into our waters. You know, I mean, we have not seen this level of provocation from anybody, frankly. Even the Russians have not, I, I couldn't compare the Russian level of provocations, which have been pretty extreme recently, to what the Chinese are doing. So the question is, why are the Chinese doing this? Is just a big head fake? Are they trying to deceive us? You know, is this really because they really want peace in the world like they just said in the wake of this thing? Or are they actually intending to disrupt the status quo in East Asia in two years if their economy doesn't decisively turn around? And I happen to think the latter is probable. She, so, Toshi, what, 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 what should be the reaction? Okay, you're representing uh, an academic institution in Beijing, but help us understand as you're sitting here in Japan, given that we're a few days away from the new security law being passed here in the upper house, uh, and con confirmation. There is a general perception and a general concern, building on what the ambassador said about, uh, uh, about ugly nationalism and imperial instincts, that there's something very sinister, and that has to be the planning assumption being made, not just by Japan, but other nations as well in this region. Well, I don't know why um, Washington is so single-mindedly concerned with uh, the South China Sea disputes. I don't know why. Um, when I, whenever I talk to ambassadors and, and uh, you know, diplomats in Beijing, when they come over to my office, and they always ask the question, if you claim, on the one hand, you will pursue only peaceful rise, and then on the other hand, what you are doing in the South China Sea and other parts of the world, world you know, um, obviously contradict your peaceful rise uh, rhetoric. So what is happening there? And I said, you know, nobody knows. Maybe only President Xi Jinping. And even President Xi Jinping may not have a clear idea and who is doing what uh, in the waters in South China Sea. Now, speaking of this uh, disrupting the status quo, uh, I understand why Westerners uh, would take that point of view, disrupting the status quo. But from a Chinese point of view, they say, look, uh, we have that historical claim, even though you can debate that claim. And second, 
we are doing that just to safeguard uh, these sea lanes that are vital to Japan, but as well as to Chinese uh, you know, shipping industries too. So, so why you just only have the United States to, to station the troops there, to, uh, to patrol that area of uh, the waters? And third, when you look at Chinese uh, uh, records, the histories, um, I think the last time the Chinese was involved in any armed conflict was back in 1987 or 1988 with the Vietnamese over land border and some uh, naval skirmishes on South China Sea. So it's really to make a far-stretched argument that China is really the one that intends to overturn the table and establish a new order. And if you look at US record, again, I'm not an apologist for the Chinese government, but I'm just saying to play the devil's advocate, the Chinese government also can make a very strong argument. Who is actually really disrupting peace and stability around the world? It's the United States. It's not China. Okay, we can debate about that. We can debate about that. But look at Iraq and Afghanistan, right? Let me let me stop here. I'm pretty sure you know we have uh, two. Uh, very, well, I, I, I better I better get I better, better get an American view. Fukushima Fukushima San. Um, the United States is is um, destabilizing around the world. They are the prime uh, reason for this kind of reaction from the People's Republic. Well, I think uh, that's nonsense, but um, I, would, uh, I would say that actually with regard to uh, the Bush administration, there were a lot of mistakes that the Bush administration made, I would say, and uh, that um, uh, at the same time, however, I, I think it is uh, pretty clear that China's view is that it had in the past been a couple of hundred years ago, uh, the Middle Kingdom, and was the center of the world, and was uh, the center of Asia with tributary states, and that uh, many people in China believe that there's been a couple of hundred years of humiliation, and that China deserves to res be restored to its rightful place in the world. And so I think that fundamental view is, is, uh, is a reality. And so I think that uh, the United States and Japan and other countries need to recognize that uh, there's a great deal of sensitivity in China about how it's treated by the rest of the world. And now that it's reached a certain level of economic development, I think it believes that it, it deserves uh, more respect. And uh, so as one of my professors uh, at Harvard, Ezra Vogel, uh, had said, uh, in dealing with China, one needs to be very firm, but one should not provoke and uh, I still, I think that's a very, very good uh, motto to, uh, to work with. And with regard to the South China Sea, as well as the East China Sea, I think the United States should be very firm. And I, firm, I, per I, per I personally believe, I'm not talking for the Obama administration, but I would personally argue that uh, the United States should be firmer than it has been with regard to developments in the South China Sea and East China Sea. Um, but I think that, um, the criticism by China that it's the United States that's trying to disrupt the world, I think, is uh, factually incorrect. Uh, I also think, however, that Kunimiyake is being a bit, um, uh, not sure what the best word is, <laughs> unrealistic, maybe, uh, in saying that um, Japan being a status quo power, Japan wants to be a status quo power because it has been number two, now it's number three, but it has enjoyed uh, the fruits of the post-war period, 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, even now, it's one of the wealthiest countries of the world. So obviously, Japan wants to maintain the status quo. That's understandable. But it's also understandable that China wants to change the status quo to become more respected in the world. And I think that China does deserve a certain level of respect for its achievements and its accomplishments and what it can contribute to the world. So Let I me... think we should be engaging with China to make sure that China does contribute positively as opposed to provoking China and to trying to uh, accuse it of uh, doing nasty things. Well, Darren Min Minapni, uh, who's part of the faculty here, um, reminds us, of course, it's not just about China and the United States and Japan. It's also about Vietnam and the Philippines. There are other critical issues in the geopolitics of East Asia. So can you factor that in? Because he asks, given Japanese constitutional limits on deployment of self-defense forces at the moment, of course, how realistic is it for Vietnam, Philippines, et cetera, to see Japan as a military ally uh, 
to offset China? In other words, can, you, can I ask you to define where you see their strategic and, 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 and other concerns about the, yes please, about the, uh, about the way the political landscape is shifting at some considerable speed uh, in this region? Miyaki-san. Yes, uh, the Vietnamese or Filipinos are concerned, definitely. And uh, their uh, coast guards are so weak uh, uh, in comparison with the uh, Chinese official vessels. So they have enough reasons to seek more support uh, internationally, including uh, one from Japan. And we are, uh, as Glenn said, uh, I am unrealistically uh, 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 assert that uh, uh, we are a status quo power. We are, and we want the status quo in South China Sea. So we want to help those uh, status quo powers in, the, in that part of the world to keep, maintain the status quo. So uh, it, does it mean that Japan's going to be their ally? Well, I do not know. It's premature to talk about it. I think what we need is the, maritime, the need for maritime uh, uh, cooperation among like-minded nations, countries in, that, in this part of the world to maintain the status quo. And if the uh, pressure uh, uh, gets more and more militarly uh, uh, in that part of the world for the Filipinos or Vietnamese, they may seek some more uh, military uh, cooperation or support. They may seek most military support from uh, uh, outsiders. Uh, and then probably uh, the United States will be invited to come first. And what about Japan? I have no idea. And we are not necessarily ready for that. But what we are interested in is not whether it's uh, a military uh, alliance or not, but we want international uh, uh, cooperative uh, 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 activities to maintain the status quo in that part of the world. Well, Miyaki, the sorry, world. let me just press you on that because you did say earlier we have to prepare for failure. That could be fatal. That's right. That's right. Uh, which is very, very tough language by any standards, building on rather what David Asher was saying as well. But that means thinking the unthinkable almost at the mm -hmm. moment. And Leo Castillo is, has made a point here. Um, given the Spratlys and the West Philippines, South China Sea, et cetera, et cetera. What do you see as Japan's best role in this before it, become, before, before it becomes a real crisis and when it does reach the worst case scenario? Because you say you don't know, but actually that's not a planning Deterrence assumption. Is but let me finish. That's not a planning assumption in any capital these days. Don't know is not good enough. Okay. Uh, the deterrence is... is, is um, uh, uh, collective concept. And it's not something uh, done by one nation or one group of nations. The deterrence, when I, when, I, when I talk about deterrence in this part of the world, I, I always think about the first concentric circle. Americans are busy. Europeans are busy. You have troubles in Europe. You have troubles in the Middle East. And we, have, we may have some in Asia. So the, the real question is, are we ready to cope with three uh, theaters of operation, for And example? the answer is? The answer is no. The answer is no. So if something happens simultaneously, or multiple things happen simultaneously, we may not be able to cope with the situation completely. Or, and in that case, we need to do some more. So we should be ready to uh, uh, argument or reinforce the level of uh, deterrence if necessary. Glenn Fukushima, what do you think, uh, particularly after what happened two years ago with the testing, uh, with the sudden unilateral declaration of the, the air zone, which caused no end of trouble for commercial aircraft and also then led to the deployment of, of ships and the B-52 as well at one point, um, in terms of the reaction and the ability of, uh, of Washington to understand this need for some kind of both political, diplomatic, and if necessary, hardware uh, for deterrence? Well, I think it's pretty clear that uh, Ashton Carter and Susan Rice and John Kerry are monitoring the situation in China. 
and that uh, if there are activities, as in the South China Sea, uh, Ashton Carter was very clear in his comments a few months ago about the need for China to cease doing this. Uh, and I think that uh, there is uh, certainly going to be greater assets, uh, military assets the United States is going to be putting in Asia as part of the whole Asia pivot, Asia rebalance. I, I don't think there's any question that uh, in terms of the worldwide uh, security uh, re requirements that, uh, that East Asia is going to be rising in importance for the United States. So, I mean, I, I don't think that uh, people in Japan or Vietnam or Philippines ought to be, to be worried about the American commitment. And, uh, and I think that, you know, this is the case whether it's a, uh, a Democratic or Republican administration. So I, I'm, uh, I'm pretty confident that uh, China is seen uh, by the United States, by, by Washington, as, uh, as a very potential uh, future military rival, and we need to be dealing with that. Can you imagine that at the banquet at the White House in a couple of weeks, the president is going to say to President Xi, uh, lay down very clearly Washington's concerns? Because if he doesn't, that will su suggest that actually Washington is not that concerned. Well, I don't have any doubt that these concerns will be expressed in the private conversations with the president. Uh, the only question is to what extent they're going to be made public uh, because there are pros and cons of making st strong statements of that sort public. So that's, that's the only question I would have. But I think in private, there's no question in my mind whether it's cybersecurity, South China Sea, uh, human rights, all of these issues I think will be clearly on the agenda, and uh, I, I believe the president actually has very strong views about these issues. Shitao, what's your reaction to this? Because I come back to, you know, there are two important questions, what Lawrence Tan asked at the beginning. How does J Japan view China's resurgence? How should Japan react uh, on China's attempt to change the status quo? And Hiroshi Goto, the security law is going to be passed this week. What does it mean to Japan's survival and surrounding countries, especially China, in the current geopolitical context. In other words, there's deep concern, and notwithstanding what you've said, not really that sense of confidence about the direction in which China in particular is moving, and therefore the impact on the geopolitics of East Asia. No, I'd like to ask you, your, your reaction to, to, to this, and these kind of questions being asked, in other words, the deep concern. Well, you look at Eastern Asian uh, security in general, um, it's unrealistic for either China or Japan to make the assumption that you can have prosperity and uh, security without the other side. You know, to borrow from a language from the United States is that no Japan left behind. If you can really, you, if you're really aiming at uh, Eastern Asian security structure, you know, so the Chinese, realistically, you cannot think that China can completely dominate. But let me say a few words about this South China Sea because everybody's mentioned this South China Sea. There's actually a quite big mismatch between US and China in terms of behavior and rhetoric. You look at Washington's rhetoric, it's getting tougher and tougher. You know, this is very important. United, the United States needs to get to firmer and firmer to show that we are determined to uh, uh, deter the Chinese. But then you look at what is happening on the ground. The Chinese doing what, what in English we call the salami approach, right? Just piece by piece, we're building up these artificial islands. Now, if you have some accidents, let's say U.S. reconnaissance airplanes you know, colliding with the Chinese fighter jets, like a repeat of 2001, would you go back to Congress and say, let's have a war with China? That's the problem for the United States. These are not the vital or core interests of the United States of America. If it's Japan, if it's South Korea, it's different. But these are just a couple of, uh, most of them are uninhabitable islands. So how can you justify this uh, aggressive approach? And second, this all talk about China's rise makes this a big and I would say problematic assumption for people who are economists to hear. How can you assume what is China's economic growth rates for the next five years? You look at the great fall of the China stock market. You know. I'm actually I just a small victim of this uh, stock market crash. <laughs> but there are people who are losing a lot of money, you know, millions of dollars. You know. So you have to make a lot of assumptions about the continuing economic rise of China and by the extension, the rising military strength of the Chinese. Well, uh, my friend David Asher is going to say something be uh, uh, after I say something. Um, 
That's exactly what I, what I remember we must have heard in 1920s. You know, so I don't want to go into details. The real problem about China is the following. You said the people are so are fond of uh, Japan, and we do too. We, we, like, we like China, uh, Chinese people. You know, we like Chinese food. The, the problem is not the people-to-people -people relationship. The problem is because we are dealing with international politics, and we have to deal with the government. The problem is that the Chinese government may not represent the whole people who may like Japan. You said that the Chinese don't know what's going to happen, and even Xi Jinping doesn't know. That's the problem. You see, Mr. Abe understands what's going to happen because he's represented the people. And, but unfortunately, the real threat or real concern on, on our part is that we do not know who's in charge and who, what's going to happen to China and who's controlling it. And especially, as I said before, who's controlling their armed forces? That's the problem. As we, we lost control of our armed forces uh, in, before the World War II. Why? You know why? Because uh, the, we misinterpreted the, our old constitution, saying that the chain of command is independent, directly goes up to the, to the emperor. So is the Chinese prime minister gets report from the PLA? No. The state, uh, head of state of the Chinese state, People's Republic of China, get reports from the PLA? No. Because PLA is a communist party's armed forces. And only the chairman of the Central Military Commission get reports from the PLA. That's the problem China has. Thank you. We don't have anyone here. David, I'll come back to you in a moment. In a moment. No, wait a minute. Wait, 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 David, wait, wait, wait. Uh, <clears throat> we don't have anyone here from uh, DPRK, I assume. So we can't talk about uh, North Korea, because obviously that is of deep concern as well. Taro Kono, can I come to you, please, uh, as, a, uh, as a senior political figure? How, how do you think this is all being read in, the political, in political circles here? Please. Well, we have experienced uh, Chinese military expansion in South China Sea. That is an undeniable fact. And if they control the air in the South China Sea, they will control the sea. And that's the, our sea lines of communication. So we are threatened. And we are a little bit afraid that because of the US uh, budget deficit, if United States decided to sort of pull out of the Middle East or Asia, who's going to fill the void? It's going to be Chinese military, and that is a nightmare for Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and the ASEAN countries. And that's why we are debating hard in the parliament to pass these security bills. Uh, this is just the insurance. I hope we're not going to use any collective uh, security measures in the near future, but this is just in case. So also, uh, at the same time, we need to build a better economic relationship with China. I mean, Chinese economy is falling apart, and uh, I think everyone needs to rush in and sort of save China. Uh, but uh, I don't think we could allow Chinese military to do whatever they want to do. And at the same time, we need to come rushing into China to help their economy. So it is very critical moment if Chinese Communist Party will come forward uh, really in control of the economy and the military and the transparency? Or uh, are they still be not transparent and uh, be a sort of a center of uh, disruption in the global economy and the global geopolitics? Nori Shikata um, raises an important issue about the kind of signals that China could send regarding the legal case on South China Sea brought by the Philippines against China, because China has so far refused to show up at the International Court. Isn't there room for China to agree on addressing this issue, um, which would significantly improve China's image in terms of respecting uh, the rule of the law. In other words, you can send signals, not just in Tiananmen Square on the 3rd of September, but also uh, through the 
agreed systems that are in place to try and resolve suspicions at sea? You know, I can only say I was told by somebody of, uh, you know, who had access to the Chinese MOFA. They say the MOFA people actually were caught off guard by Philippines' decision to really send the case to the International Court of Arbitration. And they also kind of felt very bad about having no Chinese representative to argue the case uh, at the court, uh, rejecting the case because China is a member of UNCLOS, but China also has that special statement saying China does not necessarily accept the jurisdiction from the international court. Uh, but having said that, you but know, that I, doesn't stop them responding at some point or giving a, a signal of an intention to respond. Right, but there's debate, uh, obviously, because the decision is pending, right? So there's a lot of debating about what to do after the decision is released. And, and speaking of this, I just want to add one dimension about this, because many people mentioned about Southeast Asia. Today, at least within the Chinese academia and uh, the policy circle, there's a lot of a soul searching about what went wrong with China and ASEAN relationship. And oftentimes, the good or positive example is Japan-ASEAN relationship. So there's a lot of uh, study about the competition of so-called soft power between China and Japan in Southeast Asia. Japanese appear to have done much, much better job in winning uh, uh, local people's support, the good feelings, than the Chinese government, even though the latter has invested a lot more than the, Chinese government, than the Japanese government did. But it looks like the evidence so far supports that Japan is a winner in terms of public diplomacy. So there's, so there's a lot of soul searching. What we did bad, how can we improve this? Let me just pick up on, on that DPRK issue, um, because uh, Kofuji raises a critical issue here about the balance in Japanese minds between the Chinese threat and the North Korean threat at the moment. Um, the relationship between the recent collective defense security bill, which is due to pass this week, and the increasing Chinese military threat. Japanese politicians and media only talk about threats in North Korea, trying to skirt around the China issue so as not to provoke the Chinese. Glenn, what's the view from Washington, um, in your perspective, about DPRK at the moment, particularly after what's been happening? First of all, in enormous military actions, and then suddenly wanting to talk again about family um, reconciliations and so on. What kind of, can you, can you judge what DPRK is up to, and therefore whether it, it will ever be a benign threat as opposed to a very active threat? Well, I think the view in Washington is that uh, North Korea is very difficult to uh, predict in terms of its behavior. On the other hand, I don't think it's um, correct to say that it's acting irrationally. I think it's acting in ways that it believes can uh, further its own uh, interests. And uh, so they're testing the United States. And uh, so I think that it's uh, necessary for the United States to be very firm about North Korea as well. I, um, I frankly believe that the United States should be engaged more with North Korea. I think that uh, there has to be a more active engagement with North Korea. Um, I, I know that uh, some, uh, even in this current administration, Obama administration, uh, believe that it's not um, constructive to do so. I personally believe that uh, the U.S. should engage much more with North Korea and to uh, try to influence the outcome there. Well, basketball players and, um, no. and Eric Schmidt can go there, but uh, it's not enough. yeah, okay, right. But this point, particularly about about the relative perceptions of DPRK threat and the Chinese threat, skirting around. Ko Fuji saying, I want to hear honest discussions, otherwise the Japanese public will not be able to decide if the law is really necessary. Me? Um, well, from the uh, public uh, relations purposes, uh, I, I really thank the North Korean government because they are doing all the nasty things and so easy for me, at least personally, to uh, explain why we need such laws. But, uh, let, let, I, 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 I'm, uh, well, let, let me be uh, quite honest. Uh, I think North Korea is becoming an episode, okay? Um, it, it's doomed, and it's, about, it's, it's doomed to collapse anyway, sooner or later. Hard landing, soft landing, we never know. But it's going to be doomed. The question is, uh, the North Korea, uh, North, North Koreans are becoming an episode, and the South Koreans are eyeing the future unification. Okay? When it comes to North Korea, if there's a threat from North Korea, 
Japan or US South Korea and US Japan, okay, tripartite cooperation would work. But unfortunately, they don't think that way anymore because North Korea is an episode, but they don't fight because if they fought, then they will win. It's a matter of weeks, but before the end of the war, Seoul will be in flame and the North, uh, South Korean economy will be gone. That's why they don't start war. So that means that's why North Korea is becoming an episode. So the South Koreans are now eyeing China. When it comes to China-South Korea relations, or China-unified Korea relations, good US-South Korea relations doesn't work, doesn't help. Good US, uh, good Japan, uh, South Korea relations doesn't help. All right, let me just ask the, the view from Beijing about what kind of assessment you can make of DPRK. I'll give you one minute. I can't say much about, you know, this, this, this like, you know, but I just tell you, look at the signs, you know, symbolic diplomacy on 3rd of uh, September. President Park was standing just next to President uh, Vladimir Putin, and then Vladimir Putin was standing next to President Xi Jinping. So that's a lot of message to Japan, and that's also a lot of message to DPRK. All right, well, look, I'm very struck by um, what, uh, what the ambassador said about ugly nationalism and impartial um, uh, and imperial instincts. But David, I'm almost tempted to ask you to say this yourself, but I'm gonna read it because we're running out of time. This is from David Asher. Projected North Korea ICBM launch on October the 10th, the 17th anniversary of the North Korean Workers' Party, massive test of US, ja Japan, collective self-defense, if the missile is not engaged with Aegis-based missile defense, imagine if the DPRK can successfully launch a nuclear-armed ICBM against the US. Trump's hairpiece will catch on fire, and that would be a real inferno. David, I'm sure you could have said that much better than me, but I think we've left, you, you've left a very clear message of even in the next 28 days, there's a lot of uncertainty coming from DPRK, quite apart from what the signals China sent on the 3rd of September. I think we've done, um, we've managed to at least review where we are today on the 13th of September, but who knows what is gonna happen next. Can I thank you, all three, and all of you who contributed uh, as well. <laughs>